Good morning, everybody. Welcome to episode 214 now. And welcome along to Tuesday, the, the, the 15th of June. I nearly said the 14th, but my apologies. Well, today on the show, we're going to be recapping on last week's show, but before that, um, I have an announcement to make. Instead of putting the title of what we talked about, we're just going to do the day of the week, and it makes sense. Here's Alec now to open the show and to tell you about the name change. Thanks, Barry. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, and yep, it sounds like a great uh, a great change that, that we're going to put through on your videos now. So we're going to switch from having a description of the content of the video to the day of the week, which is not a nice sort of simple way of identifying the video for the viewers. So it sounds like a, a, a nice change to me and uh, looking forward to it. So, today on the show we're going to be recapping on what we did last week. Now, we had an awesome trip last week and of course we went to Manly. Now, Manly is such a beautiful place, but like Alex Jordan and I said on the Bob and Glenn video and Manling video, and, and we're going to say this at Bellarum Reserve next week, if you take your rubbish in or bring it in, please take it out. Don't be a tosser or a little bug or leave your broken glass behind so that people can easily cut their foot on it. So if it's not in the bin, guys, it's on you and do the right thing. Here's Alec now to open that, the show with that also. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, totally. So we have had a, uh, some great outings in beautiful places um, and they've been really nice and clean and no, there hasn't been any rubbish and it's been fantastic. Uh, mainly last week, the beaches were beautiful, but uh, we've got to make sure that we keep them that way, you know. So if you take rubbish down there, you know, if you have food down on the beach or if you say a bottle of, of something to drink, make sure that you take it with you. Don't leave it. Don't let the bottles break and put glass everywhere and, you know, put the, put the rubbish in the bins provided or even take them with you. Um, and that way we'll keep these places really beautiful. Uh, and... Our, our parks and, and waterways and public transport, guys, it's not, it's not a place to dump your rubbish, so please don't be a tosser, don't pick up your rubbish and go whack. Here's Alec now to tell you about it. Yeah, that's right. Don't just toss it out the window, don't leave it there at the beach, make sure you take it with you. I mean, there are bins provided in, in all of these beautiful places, you know, down at Bob and Head, down at Manly. It's just so easy to put your rubbish in the bin. Um, it's kind of amazing that people still don't do that from time to time. Um, and it really impacts everybody else, you know, and not just the people, right? So it's, it's kind of ha has a bad impact on um, the environment as well, you know, the wildlife, and the plants, so it's very important that uh, we make sure that rubbish goes in the bins provided or that people take it with them. And the same with the toilets as well. Don't put your rubbish, don't put your rubbish in the, in the, the toilet, so only put toilet paper in there. Don't put any other rubbish in there because it could block the, the, the toilets. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. So we don't want uh, those public toilets that are there for everybody to use. We don't want them being blocked and being out of service. So we've got to make sure that only the right things go down in, in the toilets and not rubbish. 
because they will get blocked, and particularly those low-lying ones, you know, the ones down at the beach, um, you know, you really don't want them to, to be blocked. That would be pretty bad. So, um, yeah, definitely just use the bins for your rubbish or take it with you. You know, there's no reason why you can't take the your rubbish. And we'll take a break. Welcome back. This is the opening sequence of our show now and episode 214. Now, getting back on to keeping Madeline clean and the toilets and all. Okay. We, we know that you like to go to Manly and go on the beach and whatever, but don't be a totter and litter the beach and go with, with your rubbish and just dump it. Because who's responsible for your rubbish? You. Here's Alec. That's right, Barry. Thanks for that. I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying, mate. So if you have rubbish down at Manly, which is a beautiful place down there on the beach, you definitely are responsible for that rubbish. So make sure that you take care of it. You don't just leave it. Don't leave it to someone else to look after. Take responsibility, put it in the bins provided or take it with you, take it home and put it in your own bin at home. And don't litter your car, your, your own car either. Here's my offsider. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, you don't want to be driving a car around that's full of rubbish, it won't be very nice. I mean, what if you want to give someone a lift somewhere and your car's full of rubbish? So, not a nice look at all. So yeah, you want to take it with you, put it in the bins provided, or take it home and put it in the bin at home, for sure. And the same with disabled taxis. Don't litter the taxis. Clean, clean it up and no eating or drinking in the taxi driver. In my offside. Yeah, that's right. And particularly taxis, because taxis are shared by everybody, right? So, you know, you don't you don't want to be getting into a taxi that someone else has used and they've left all this rubbish or maybe they've drunk something and spilled it or eaten something and spilled crumbs everywhere. You know, you don't you don't want that at all. So you want to be able to take a taxi and be comfortable that it's gonna be clean and tidy and um, and it's it's gonna be a nice experience for you to travel where you need to go. And uh, especially on, on the trains too, and ferries, and even on the hydro forms if they're around. Here's Alec. Yeah, wow. Okay, so there's a blast from the past. Um, I also remember the hydro foils, Barry. They were, I don't think they, they have been around for a long time. I reckon they were decommissioned, what, 10 or 20 years ago? I'm not sure. But they were a lot of fun, actually, riding on the hydrofoils. Um, but as you say, um, you know, public transport, whether it's a hydrofoil or a ferry and a train, got to keep them nice and tidy as well. Um, because it's nice for everybody else um, to be traveling on public transport that's clean and tidy. And even on our mini bus as well, so, so please keep our mini buses clean. Here's my offside. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the mini bus in a way is like a taxi. You know, this is a shared resource that everyone can use. Um, and it's, you know, I think they're even owned by, um, by the CPA. So it's just really important that we keep them nice and clean and tidy so that they last, you know? So don't... Just pick up your rubbish and go whoosh, pour, pour, pick it up and dispose of it whoosh, in the bin. Here's my other special guest this week. Welcome along. Thank you, Barry. So what do you think of this? I think it's a great idea to share um, this to the world and um, yeah to be careful with your rubbish, teach your kids not to do that. And also, um, 
a minute at another room when you're out in public. Uh, no urinating in public. Not on taxis because taxis are not bathrooms, guys. Keep my upside. Yeah, absolutely. So um, hard to imagine anybody doing that. That you know, in their right state of mind. But um, you know, keeping taxis clean, all bodily functions should stay in the bathroom. That's let's <laughs> let's have that as a rule. Um, and I think I suspect that if you did come across a taxi that smelled like urine, that it was probably somebody who was really really drunk. Um, mm -hmm. And they, you know, you really don't want them in a taxi at all. You don't want them to get that drunk. Um, and I guess, yeah, so that is a pretty good rule. I would have thought, though, most people will stick to that rule. Hopefully people will stick to that. But it's important that we, that we bring it up on the show so that they know what we're talking about. Yeah, for sure. And I think the public places is another good one as well. So, you know, you want people to use the bathrooms provided. Um, and, and, and not go wherever they want to go. So I think that's a, that's a, a really good point to make. And um, before we get on to the day show, okay, we had a blast from the past. We had Huey Lewis and the new one in the van coming back here to the studio. And my word, it was an absolute um, crack around the drive back here. Here's Alec to tell you what. It, it totally was. It was so good. So the outing before, uh, when we went to Bob and Head, we were talking about the fact that the vans have CD players. Um, and we thought, well, we should get a CD. And I wasn't sure what to bring. And I found a bunch of old CDs at home. And so did we, had we talked about Huey Lewis in the news? Well, we had talked about a song or something, hadn't we? Yes, we did. Yeah, we talked about a Huey Lewis in the News song, and I found a best of Huey Lewis in the News CD. And we don't even have like a CD player at home anymore. We haven't had one for like a decade or two decades, right? But I still had these old CDs. I don't know why I hadn't, hadn't got rid of them. So we put Huey Lewis on in the van on the way home and cranked up the volume, and it was fantastic. And poor old Georgia, who is... In it, let's say in a different generation to us, right? She's, she's in a slightly different generation to Barry and me. She was very good about it. She had heard a couple of the songs, right? So she did even recognise a couple of them. Um, but it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun in the, in the, in the van on the way home. And, and, and it was really great that, that we were able to have a different route back. So. That uh, was our outing to Bob and uh, to Manly guys, and if you, and before we close the book on last week, uh, just going over the rooms one more time. Okay, if you bring your rubbish in, please dispose of it. Don't go on the ground. Pick it up and put it in the bins provided. Hit my offside to close last week's show with that. Yeah, thanks, Barry. It was a great outing. The beaches were clean and tidy, and it was it was great that people had been doing that, putting their rubbish in the bin. Um, and we need everybody to keep it up. Let's let's keep it up. Keep keep our public places really clean and tidy. And another rule: don't bring large amounts of money anywhere. Don't carry large amounts of money around because someone will just go come up to you and go and then that's your money gone. Be careful of that. Here's Alec now to close the last week's show with that. Yeah, thanks, Barry. That's right. So be careful um, with with your your cash if you're carrying any cash. Don't carry too much, um, and you know make sure that you've got it in a safe place so that um, a pickpocket or someone like that can't get access to it. And they could go. Yeah, absolutely. They could just very 
quickly and easily um, take take your cash from you. So you want to keep it keep it close. Having said that, I think Sydney is a pretty safe place, like relative to a lot of places around the world. Um, it's a good rule and a good habit to be in because you can be anywhere and that can happen. Uh, but we are a little bit lucky in Australia that it does it happens a little bit less than some of the other places around the world. And don't let anybody know your pen or stand around automatic telling machines. Don't watch them get their money out. Here's Alec now to take us out. Yeah, that's right, Barry. Don't don't let anyone else see your pin when you're um, when you're using an ATM. That's a great rule, mate. So that's the end of episode two hundred and eleven. The recap, and now here's today's show. I'm Barry Thiel along with Alec Taylor and and uh, my special guest for this week. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you, Barry. Welcome everyone to today's book review. And today we have the famous five and it's called Five on a Hike Together. Oh, hold up. And here it is for the book lovers out there like me. Now, just an explanation about the book. Okay, Julian, Dick, Anne and George and Timmy the dog, they're planning a long weekend away across, across the moors. Now, at the start of this book, ladies and gentlemen, and book club is out there, and received a letter from her brother Julian. And, and well, it's actually George, I think. Let's have a look. Yeah, okay. And what the press part. A letter from Julian. That's right. So um, George and Anne are um, going to the same school um, and um, Anne's brothers, are they both brothers? Julian and, and Dick. And Dick, yes. Um, which is such a funny old fashioned name. Mm -hmm. You don't hear that much anymore. Mm -hmm. But what I really like about George is she's this tomboy. Um, I think her name's actually Georgina. But everybody calls her George. Because she hates being called Georgina. Yeah. And, I, I mean, this book was written in the 1940s. And, um, she, you know, she, they've got this self-expressing gender identity, which is just really fantastic. Mm. You know, she's this, she's this young woman who is uncomfortable being girly, likes being more boyish, and has friends that support her in doing that and it's just a really nice sort of aspect of the story but you're right sorry mate bit of a digression she gets a letter from julian saying let's go on a hike so in order to do that julian met may up okay and he was planning on where to go on the hike so so he tells um, Anne and George to pack the necessary things for this time. He's my offsider. That's right. So Julian calls up um, with what they call an expensive telephone call. So, <laughs> so back in the day, um, you know, it actually cost quite a bit of money to make a telephone call. And, but he's planned the whole thing. He's talked about, you know, what he wants them to bring, what he wants them to wear, where they're going to go. Um, he's got it all arranged. Um, and in fact, interestingly, wants them to bring Timmy the dog along. So I, this is, was my first famous five book, right? I'm thinking, oh, what, there are five kids or something. No, there are four kids and a dog. So the uh -huh. dog Timmy, who actually speaks from time to time. So Wolf says Timmy as if he approved thoroughly. So Timmy is actually like a character in this book um, and actually plays a pretty important role in the story as well. 
Um, I love the fact that Timmy's one of the five. Mm. So, so then when Friday morning comes, okay, both of the girls are up very early indeed, and they're taking Timmy down to the kennels to get him all spruced up for Julian and Dick. Okay, so they have they have a good breakfast. And then they say goodbye to Miss Peters, who is their, their mistress at school or teacher, as we call them here in Australia. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. So they pack all their gear, they get food and stuff. They decide not to bring a bone for Timmy, which is a, sounds like a really sensible thing to me. A big and the bone is terribly smelly as well. Yeah, so they leave the bone behind, <laughs> which, which I think is a good call. I read that. This is still in the first chapter, I think. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, so they leave the bone behind, but they're taking Timmy the dog with them, have a huge breakfast, and then get ready to go off and meet the, the boys um, for their outing. So it's for three boys and a girl? Yeah, no, so two boys, two girls. Oh, two so Anne and, and George, Georgina, okay. um, and Timmy the dog. And in fact, George, I think Timmy is George's dog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then they're meeting Julian and Dick. And Julian, Dick, and Anne are siblings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so then, so then. At last they set out off on their long weekend, but later in that chapter, after the, everyone had a drink of orange juice, okay, the jury and ask, can they make sandwiches? Can the shop woman make sandwiches for them because they don't want to be going around finding a village at lunchtime. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. And I think one of the really interesting things about Enid Blyton's books is that they're all about these kids and quite often she talks about what they eat, you know, and they always have these fantastic meals with lots of different types of food, really yummy meals. They eat, they seem to eat a lot of cream, like, <laughs> like, you know, raw sort of cream and like, do you remember in that other book, uh, what was the book we read? Um, the was, Secret the Island. The Secret Island, right. So in that one, these kids run away and they make all these meals for themselves. Um, lots of yummy food. And in this one, there's quite a lot of food as well. So, and this shop woman, who they visit in the first village that they stop at, makes them piles of sandwiches and oh. gives them cake, I think. Well, um, fruit cake. Fruit cake. Um, and uh, all, of, all of this great food to try and kind of last them for two or three meals while they're off roaming the moors, the moors in England. So, it's the first day, it's fri Friday morning. Now, on the first day, Timmy gets himself stuck in a hole, a rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And he is obsessed with rabbits. Um, and so, I mean, it's good that he is really a, a very doggy dog. Um, so you totally understand. Timmy is like out of control chasing rabbits. Goes down a big hole and gets stuck and they actually have to pull him out. And while they're pulling him out, he gets hurt. Right, so he's, he becomes lame, in fact. He gets a limp, which is, which is a bit of a worry. So, while that is happening, George is panicking, and George is worried because it might spoil the whole weekend. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. So, so she starts to get worried about him. She's like, this is pretty weird. She, they can't find something really wrong with Timmy. Don't understand why he's limping. 
He's got a bruise on his back as well. They're like, oh no, this is no good. We're going to have to do something about it. Okay, so they try and find a vet, but sadly they can't find a vet anywhere. Here's Alec. That's right. So they, they go to the nearest town and they say, do you have a vet? No, we don't have a vet. The nearest vet is like 15 miles away or five miles away or something like that. Too far away. I don't know if you remember the exact number of miles, Barry. Pretty good with those, those types of things. But anyway, the vet is not nearby, but there is um, a, a local, I think he's a local farmer who's good with horses and dogs. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and there, this is the point at which they split up. And I'm like, no, <laughs> don't do that. Don't split up. So two of them go off to take Timmy to this guy whose name is Gaston. Mr. Gaston. Mr. Gaston. So two of them take Timmy. Um, it's actually Julian and George take Timmy off to meet Mr. Gaston while Anne and Dick forge ahead to try and find the farmhouse that they're going to stay the night in. So it was a pretty interesting start to the story. Here's my offline. It is a really interesting start to the story, but this is where it gets really interesting. Um, and what I was really surprised about from this point on is how dark and creepy it gets. I didn't realize that the famous five stories were so sort of, you know, creepy and, and a little scary. And I was wondering do, if you wanted to read a little bit from maybe chapter five. Or, or, or we can just talk about it if you like. We'll just talk about it. All right, okay. Well, what, I, what is really interesting is that it, so it starts, chapter five starts this way. It began to get dark very suddenly, right? And so it's just setting up here. Mm -hmm. The mood is like, it gets and starts to rain. It gets dark. They get lost. Um, this is Anne and Dick. So, so two of the four, two of the five, I should say, because Timmy is one of the, absolutely <laughs> one of the five. And they decide to, to, to take a shortcut cut across a field and they go across a creek and they get wet and then they come across this stranger who just says one word to them it's not even a word he just says arr, arr. so there are pirates on the moors now <laughs> he's not a pirate but um, yeah so it's pretty it's pretty scary it gets pretty scary for Ann and Dick they're they're out it's night time it's raining it's cold it's October in England um, they can't find this farmhouse um, and then they see and then they hear something. Do you remember what they hear? They hear the sound of bells um, and the bells are super creepy because they're not like um, it's not Sunday. Yeah. They're not church bells. They are um, just Bells. Creepy, bells. creepy bells and they are going on and on and on and they're like okay so that's super scary we're in the dark in the middle of a field it's raining and we're hearing bells like what is going on um, so they're pretty scared by this point and then they eventually see a light in the distance um, and they think okay so this must be the farmhouse we're going to stay the night in but the next morning after discovering now the one in the right farmhouse, ladies and gentlemen, it was uh, the wrong farmhouse. And Dick got very angry. Here's Alan. Yeah, that's right. So what happens is they rock up to this farmhouse. It's the wrong one. There's a scary old lady inside. She's stone deaf. Um, they can't get her attention. She, they end up just going into this place and they're like, can we, can we please spend the night? We need somewhere to sleep tonight. And she's like, no, you can't stay here. My son is here. Uh, or, or my son doesn't like visitors or something like he's really a very angry person. But she ends up putting Anne up in the loft 
um, and Dick goes out to sleep in the barn. And Dick has these really strange experiences through the night where people come and visit his space. They, one person confuses him for somebody else and another person um, comes in and, and sits there while Dick is trying to stay silent and not get caught um, in the corner. They get through the night, wake up in the morning, um, and, and they manage to get out of there and realise that absolutely, that this was not where they were supposed to be. What a night. Yeah. So, so, uh, Joy and George decide to phone the boys from the three shepherds. But then they finally, they finally um, went to that farmhouse there where they were supposed to stay the night and tell the story of what happened on the first night there. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. So they luckily come across, so Anne and Dick then luckily come across Julian and George and Timmy. Um, and they're like, okay, where have you been? Where have you been? Um, they're all all right, but Dick has had this super creepy and weird and a bit scary experience where he's discovered some clues, some really interesting clues. He's overheard some, some, some things that have been talked about and he's got a piece of paper that's been given to him by mistake um, from a very uh, dodgy person. And they discover what caused the bells. Do you want to take it up from there? And, and then later, they meet this angry policeman in rubles who isn't very pleased to have had to come out of, uh, from a nice meal of sausage and onions. So they walk up to this police station and uh, and, and the children told this ridiculous story about Maggie and Dirty Dick. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, little sequence of events. So it turns out that the old lady who's deaf, her son, who's this really weird and angry man, his nickname is Dirty Dick and his name is Dick too, right? So there are two characters named Dick and there's a bunch of confusion and they eventually understand what's happening. And they decide, okay, so we, what's caused these bells is it's an escaped convict. So um, the, there's a local penitentiary on the moors somewhere. Why are they walking around on the moors with a local <laughs> penitentiary? But anyway, and at one point they even say, should we go back out there? There's like this criminal on the loose. Yeah, let's go anyway. We've got the dog. We've got Timmy the dog. <laughs> and boy, Timmy is so useful at being like a security dog. But you're right. They go to Rebels um, and they talk to this one policeman. And interestingly, um, he has four villages under his control. So he feels himself to be rather an important fellow, right? So he's kind of, he's not the, he's not the best of police people. Um, and that's right, they interrupt him in a nice, a, a, a nice, in the middle of a nice meal of sausage and onions, and he's like, what do you want? Um, and they tell him their story, and it does sound fanciful, you know, when they, when they tell him what's gone on. Um, and he's like, no, leave me alone, you're a pain in the butt. Um, and Julian actually handles himself quite maturely, right? He's like, no, actually, we're just telling you this story, we're trying to do the right thing, and the policeman sort of goes, oh, okay, so you're not angry young kids, but leave me alone anyway. And he actually rips up their piece of paper, this piece of paper that they've come across. So the policeman, they grab the pieces, but he's ripped up this piece of paper and has been no help at all. So at that point, they decide to go on. They push on. They push on with their trip. Um, but what they, what they decide is, they figure out that they need to go to this place called 
gloomy water. It was one of the clues, it was one of the things that they overheard, or that Dick overheard the night before, that um, the criminal was talking about this place called gloomy water, and they decided to go there. So it's a pretty, pretty, um, eh. so this one policeman gets really angry and says, don't tell stories like that again, or I report you, but Julian maturely says, I will make a report to the local police when he gets back. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. So Julian's like, well, I'm not taking that. Um, we're not telling you a story. And he's just saying, OK, I'm going to actually report this. Um, and at that point, the policeman sort of goes, oh, I'm not dealing with a little kid here. I'm dealing with someone who kind of knows the system, I suppose. Um, and so he just says, no. Yeah, so this is, he says, don't go spreading silly stories. And Julian says, I don't think so. Um, and then asks for his piece of paper back. And that's the point at which the policeman rips it up and throws it into the road. And then Julian says, OK, don't you look up rules against littering? Here's Alec. That's right. Don't you have laws against scattering litter in your village? Isn't Barry's memory amazing? That is amazing. That <laughs> yeah. you, you, you can remember it almost word for word, and a, a single line in an, in an entire book. He does. So he's putting the policeman in his place and saying, OK, you just threw this piece of paper on, on the ground. Um, that's obviously littering. We know that's against the rules. It's against the rules in England, and it's against the rules here too. Um, and the policeman glares at him, turns on his heel, and marches back to his sausage and onions. And then George said, and I hope his dinner has gone cold. Horrid fella. Here's Alec. And I hope his dinner's gone cold, said George. Horrid fellow. Why should he think we're telling a lot of untruths? That's exactly what he said. So George is like, we do not like this guy. This guy is a super unhelpful police person. And uh, like Julian says, yes, it is, it is an odd story. It is a weird story that they're telling him. So they kind of on one level understand, but they didn't need to be treated like, like little kids by uh, the police person. But it turns out to be actually a pretty good thing because they go and explore this thing on their own. So if they hadn't done it, if the policeman had said, OK, leave it with me, I'll do it, I'll take your piece of paper and I'll investigate, they would have then just gone on their merry way. But instead, that's the point at which they decide to go and investigate themselves. So it's kind of a good thing, actually. It's certainly a good thing for the narrative in, in the story that they then go off to explore the um, mystery themselves. So let's go to the very end of the book where the couple get arrested. The couple, Maggie and Dirty Dick, get arrested and they are plundering about and the man breaks his ankle. Now, the, the children stop to help them, but Julian said, well, why, why should we help them? Now, they walk back all the way to Rebels where they had met the policeman a couple of days before. But then after that they walk into the post office and telephone Mr. Gaston, who they had met on the, at the beginning of the trip and told them the tale about what really happened. Here's my, here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. So it takes them two hours to walk to Rebels. They telephone Mr. Gaston because, frankly, they don't trust the police person to do kind of the right thing um, about the situation. It seems like Mr. Gaston's like, 
um, a sort of a respected senior person in the uh, community. But then he comes to meet them. Um, I think at the police station. I'm not sure where he meets them exactly. At the police station. Uh, he came to the police station. Mr. Gaston had already warned the inspector they were coming and he was waiting for them. That's right. So, as you can, as you can see, the story has a happy ending after all. So, and before Mr. Gaston leaves, he asks Julian, and now what's your program? And Julian replied, well, we're supposed to be back at school by three o'clock. But I don't think we, that we can arrive looking like this. We get into awful rows. Is there a hotel where we can get cleaned up and have a bath? And the inspector says, you can do that here. Here's Alec. Yeah, that's right. Um, and by the way, that's word for word what Julian uh, says he, when he asks for um, a bath and to get cleaned up. And the inspector says, you can do that here. Um, so they're at the police station. They clean themselves up. So they've been walking around the moors for three or four days, right? They're covered in mud and dirt, although a couple of them have been swimming, interestingly, which we haven't talked about. And I think swimming in October, they do get very cold <laughs> doing this. But it does mean that they're probably not... The two that were swimming probably are not as dirty as the others, but they have been roaming the moors for three or four days. They're very dirty, um, and so they're about to go back to school. They need to get back to school so they have a nice clean-up in the... Um, police station and they actually do something they brush their hair um, and they also brush their clothes which was a funny sort of expression something that I hadn't heard before and I presume was something that you did um, back in oh here we go they found their clothes neatly folded and brushed and felt grateful okay so you brush your clothes in in 1940s England right <laughs> But anyway, so their, their, their clothes are clean, they brush their hair, um, they've had a bit of a clean up and a wash, um, and then they're heading back to school. So, the and they get off of the lift back to school in the police car. Here's Alec. That's right. So it's they're cutting it really fine to get back to school. So they're absolutely maximizing their experience, which is awesome. So they're, they're using every single minute of their time away from school. Um, and the police person says, well, I'll give you a lift back to school, um, including Timmy, Timmy the dog, who is just an equal member of the famous five. Um, and they all bundle them off into the car. Um, and send them back to school, take them back to school. So we hope that you've enjoyed reminiscing about the famous five. Now, now, if you would like to obtain a copy of the book, you can look it up online, and perhaps you would like to read a bedtime story your young child. Here's Alec now for this. Yeah, absolutely. And Enid Blyton is a master of children's books. So my kids love the faraway tree stories and these are fantastic stories to either read with your kids or for them to read. Um, this was this greatly exceeded my expectations and I did expect it to be pretty good. So it was a lot of fun reading this book. I actually got it from my local secondhand bookstore. Um, there's there's one in my suburb, um, and it cost me three dollars. So it was a lot cheaper than you know buying it online. You'll probably find it in your, in your bookstore. You may may even find. I bet you will find a copy in your local library as well. So they're very easy to get. This was book ten of twenty one famous five books. So if you like them, starting on Treasure Island, five on a Treasure Island. 
Um, there are heaps and heaps of books to read. Barry, one thing I'm curious about is why did you, why do you like this book? Why is this a, a favour of yours? Why is why are you interested in in this particular book? Well, I just thought I you know like to read about about it and you, you know reminisce. Did you read it when you were younger? Well, I started to read it. I don't know at what age, but yeah. But I can tell you, viewers out there and and book readers and lovers, go and get the set on famous fine books. You will love them. Here, here, darling. That's right. Yeah, I strongly recommend them as well. Um, I think they're fantastic books. I've only read one so far and loved it. One right in the middle of the series, um, and I thought it was awesome. I was not expecting it to be as creepy as it was. It's not going to give your kids nightmares, right? This is not that kind of book, but it does have a really interesting mood and suspense, um, and it's a page turner. You know, you want to know what happens. You want to know what the mystery is. You know, you hear about these clues and you're really interested in, in the story. And you're also interested in the, the characters, these five characters and how they're going to resolve this mystery. So, um, yeah, fantastic book um, and a fantastic series. And I also strongly recommend. I'm with you, Barry. So we're going to close this subject now and move on to... Um, on to one um on to next week's show where we'll be going to Bill on now. So we're we're gonna be talking about the Northern Beaches now and another fantastic outing idea. So here's Alec now to close the second part of episode 214 now. Yeah, thanks Barry. Um, so it was a lot of fun reading that book um, and doing that review with you. Um, I, I, I'm really enjoying our book reviews and I reckon your viewers will too. Um, and yeah, looking forward to next week's outing. It should be a good one. And if I can just get Alec to hold the book up for you one more time, one more time, there it is. Go and get it from your, uh, your local bookstore or your second-hand bookstore. Get it for $3 from your bookstore, guys. Because if you love Ian and Brighton and the famous Brighton and the Secret Seven, we, we urge you to go and find it for your kids now. Before we... We go. We climb the second part today of our show. We'd like to. Uh, I'd like to tell you about what happens in Go Ahead Secret Seven. Now, Go Ahead Secret Seven is about um, a lot of things, and at the beginning of that book. Peter goes home from, from his school and someone comes up and, and bumps into him and it is Jack's sister and, and Susie gets up and grins at him and he says, she says, sorry, you were in my way. How's the Secret Seven Society going? And Peter said, You just look where you're going, Susie. And picks up his back and says, As for the Secret Seven, it's no business of yours. You are always trying to win the pair. Here's Alec. So I haven't read this one. This, this is um, a different ser series, isn't it? The Secret Seven is a completely different series. Yeah. Or does it have any of the same characters? No. So totally different characters, and I have not read this one, actually. 
Um, and I think you said, is it called Go Ahead? Go Ahead, Sacred Zen. Um, that sounds really interesting to me. Um, I, I would be keen, I don't know if you're interested in, in talking about it on another show, but I would be keen to um, have a bit of a read of that as well, if, if you'd like. Um, or happy for you to just talk about it on your own, if you'd like, as well. So it sounds, sounds like a good one, and maybe it could be a recommendation from you. So, so, and then in chapter, and then Susie is so annoying that she makes Jews of the Sacred Seven because they haven't had a meeting. And then so and then Jack, the brother, writes down the password so that he doesn't forget this. And and then, and then when the day of the Sacred Seven meeting happens or before that, Peter walks home with a solemn face and says to Janet, his sister, we have to call a Sacred Seven meeting as soon as possible. And Janet goes, oh, why? Has anything happened? And Peter shakes his head. And he goes, no, except that I met that sister, awful sister of Jack's Susie. And then before all that, Peter says, you're always snooping about. <laughs> why can't you leave us alone and try to find out our passwords and what we're doing. And then Susie goes, well, why don't you let me belong? You let Janet belong and Pam and Barbara. And Peter said, don't be silly. It's a secret seven. We cannot have any more members or we be out. And anyway, we don't want you, Susie. Okay. That sounds intriguing. So, I will bring the book in and I will read a bit to you on the next episode. Sounds great. So that's the end of the book review. Here's next week's outing. Here's Alec. Thanks, mate. Yep, sounds good. Uh, look forward to hearing a bit of that book um, on another video. Welcome back to the show. This is episode 214 right now. Coming up to um, 28 minutes to 11. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Bill Along Reserve, which will be our next adventure on um, Alec Barry and George's adventures. Here's Alec now to open the third segment with, with that. Yeah, thanks, Barry. So, uh, Billarong Reserve. Um, that's where we're heading next week, I think. Probably weather permitting. Um, I, hopefully it will be another beautiful day like we've had for the Manly outing and the Narrabeen outing. And uh, very much looking forward to it. I think that's a beautiful, one, of the, one of the really beautiful spots in uh, Sydney. <laughs> and have you been down to Bar Narrabeen Lake before, Barry? I have, yes. Yeah, so have I. And in fact, Billarong Reserve is one of the places where I used to windsurf in the 1980s and 90s. <laughs> if you can believe it, that's how long I've known that. That's what I think it's a, a great place, um, and I'm really looking forward to going. So, our opening part of the show today, if you go to Bellarm Reserve, like we, like we said in the opening of the show today, if you bring your rubbish in, do you take it out? And don't be a little bug. Here's Alec now for this. 
That's yeah. Thanks, Barry. That's really, really, absolutely right, and and very important. Um, and the, the thing about Billarong Reserve is, it's on a lake, um, and you know if you litter in this on this reserve, um, it's the rubbish is going to get washed into the lake, and it's going to you know be not nice in the lake. It's going to be bad for the wildlife, the birds, and the fish that live in the lake, um, and yeah, not a good thing at all. So very important down at Billarong Reserve to make sure that you appropriately deal with your rubbish. Because like we asked, who's going to be responsible for your rubbish? Not Alec, not Jordan, not Amber, anyone. It's your rubbish. And like we said, on public transport as well, if you've got your rubbish with you, dispose of it in the bin. If it's not in the bin, if it's not in the bin, it will be on you. Here's Alec. They totally should do an advertising campaign like that, Barry. A mashup of do the right thing, and if it's not in the bin, it's on you. I think they totally should do that. That's a marketing idea. We should share that with, like, um, I don't know, whoever it is, the, the government agency that puts those campaigns together. We should definitely share that idea with them. They should do a mashup of those two campaigns for sure. And I totally agree with the concept, by the way, the, 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 uh, the sentiment of, you know, it is your own responsibility. It's the individual's responsibility to look after their rubbish. Don't rely on somebody else. Look after it yourself. And it's the same with, with the toilets as well. Don't put your rubbish in the toilet. In my offside. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, they're a public service. They're a public utility. Um, they're there so that everyone can use them. And they should be kept clean and tidy and unblocked. You know, if things are flushed down the toilet. Rubbish is flushed down the toilet. They're going to get blocked and they're going to be not, not usable for everybody. So... And that includes a disabled person like myself here. Here, okay, so, so please do keep our parks and waterways clean and, and even the railway tracks. And don't graffiti on public transport or walls or, or on the trains. Here's another thing you shouldn't do. But we will talk about that on another episode. But getting back to Bell to Run, it is a lovely walk along the Wakers Parkway. Makes a good a good, a good day for a picnic or barbecue here at Alec. Yeah, that's right. So the walk down there is awesome. Um, they've now, I gather, um, they've actually made the track go all the way around the lake. Um, and it's pretty good. In most places, it's, it's a pretty good walking track as well. So, yeah, a great track. And we'll just pause that for a moment. This tea break is pr proudly brought to you by Del Mar Tea. And this segment is... This segment is proudly brought to you by Del Mar Tea. Next Tuesday, build well up to Bill on Run Reserve when they're permitting. Here's Alec now for this. Yeah, thanks Barry. Yeah, we are off to Billarong Reserve. Um, it, we're, according to the Bureau of Meteorology, there's going to be rain on and off over the next few days, but hopefully by Tuesday it will clear and we will we'll be able to head down to the lake um, and to have a bit of a wander around down there on the, on the boardwalk and look at the scenery. It should be really good. So I hope Tuesday will be good for our outing. Yeah, so do I. So, so, 
just going over some of the rules about visiting parks and wildlife like we said at Manly and Bob in the Cape. Don't be a tosser, okay? Don't be a little bug. If it's not on in the bin, it will be on you. And Amber, have you got anything to say on this? Well, I agree with you, Barry. No, don't be a tosser. And it's like in our group homes and day option services, don't pick up your rubbish and dump it on the floor at Oceana or anywhere, because I know Amber has worked there a few times. Yes. So the staff do a wonderful job in mm-hmm. keeping Oceana clean, so visitors, if you do come to Oceana, please dispose of your rubbish. Don't treat it like a rubbish dump. And put it, your rubbish in the bin provided. Yes, I agree. It's a beautiful place, Oceana. Beautiful and clean, so let's leave it that way. And the same with the parks too. So don't be a tosser. If it's not in the bin, if it's not in the bin, if it's not in the bin, it will be on you and do the right thing. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Here's Alec. We're going to pitch that actually to <laughs> the government because we think their new campaign should be a mashup of do the right thing yeah. and if it's not in the bin, it's on you. <laughs> it's a good idea. Well, to close yeah, this episode, we'd like to so we hope that you, you take on board what we've said today and, and really do think because it, it's a true fact if it's not in the bin, guys, it will be on you and don't let a taxi uh, clean up your mess because if you make a mess, clean it up, guys. Here's my offsider. Yeah, absolutely. If you make a mess, clean it up. Um, if it's not in the bin, it's on you. Taxis, public transport, and our beautiful places around Sydney and Australia, keep them clean, keep them tidy. And I'm I'm also um, pleased don't, don't expect other people to pick up your rubbish because if it's, if, if it's not anyone else's rubbish and it's your rubbish, ladies and gentlemen, please don't leave the parks looking like an absolute pigsty, okay? I may sound like Molly Meldrum from countdown, but this is the truth of the matter. Our parks, waterways, trains, buses, ferries, mini buses, group homes, day option services, please don't treat them like they are a rubbish tip. And if you need to dispose of any old items, go to Combricky Tip. Okay, they're located on Main and Vale Road, I think, at Ingleside, I think they are. Yep, that's right. So, we'd like to close this episode by saying, please be responsible if you're out in public. Okay, if we open the show about keeping our parkways and parkways and, and, and cycleways clean. Please abide by what we've said today. And Amber, would you agree on this? Absolutely, yes. Australia is a beautiful place. Let's leave it that way. And, and if you visit our 
the group Palm Skies, such as Oceana, the same thing. Visitors, please do take your rubbish with you or dispose of it in the bin and, and, and don't expect someone else to clean up the mess because they won't be happy and you won't be invited back there again. Hear Dan Brunel for this because she's worked at Oceana before. Yes, so Oceana is a beautiful accommodation where Barry lives, so we need to leave it nice and clean for all the residents there to enjoy the house. And we'd like to say thank you for tuning in to episode 214 today. We've had a lot of fun bringing, bringing this to you and 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 uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks. Uh, and our special guest today. And Alec, have you got anything to say to our viewers before we wrap up? Thanks for having me on the show, Barry. It was awesome. I like a little Molly Meldrum reference in there as well. I thought you were going to say, do yourself a favour. Check out the Huey Lewis Best Off CD, something like that, maybe. And I will say that. <laughs> and check out, I think it's in my bag. Hang on. Before we uh, go to day viewers uh, and music clubbers, if you have heard of Huey Lewis and the news, here it is. And... If you, if you were growing up in the 80s with Huey Lewis in the news, here are some of the songs. Can you, do you want, to, you want me to read out some of the songs or do you want to have a, have a go at naming some of them, Barry? Okay, I'll read some of them. Alright. Well, Jack one, I had a rock and roll. I want a new drug. The power of love. Okay? Stuck with you, doing it all for my baby. If this is it, do you believe in love, etc.? Yep. Aren't you great hits from the 80s, mate? So, do you believe in love? Okay, came out in the year. 1982. Here's Alec. Wow, that's pretty good memory there, Barry. And absolutely, it came out on 21st of January 1982. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> yep, and it was a cool song too. Um, lots of hits, just one of many, many hits from Huey Lewis and the News. So we thought we'd close the show by showing you the disc now. Now, not the actual disc, just the cover. All right. Okay, so there it is there, guys. So if you'd like to obtain a copy, I'm sure you can buy a copy of, of it of eBay and what's the name of the disc, Alex. So oh, it's just Greatest Hits, mate. Huey Lewis and the News, Greatest Hits. Huey Lewis and the News, Greatest Hits. Look it up on your computer as well. <laughs> Excuse me. Look it up on your computers, ladies and gentlemen. And go back in time. And another song we'd like to tell you about it. If This Is It, that was written in 1984. So if you were around that time, like I was, I was a nine-year-old, a nine-year-old in a manual wheelchair. So living at North Head then, so 1984 that song was written. So we thought we'd talk, uh, finish the show by talking about Huey Lewis in the news 
And we urge you guys, okay, to try and obtain a copy of Huey Lewis in the News' Greatest Tips. We, we suggest you put it in, um, in your... In, we suggest that you go and buy it now and, and have a listen to it for those of you that have had CD players in your car, okay? So we'd like to say thank you so much for joining us on episode 214 today. Episode 215 coming up in Steve tomorrow and we are off to uh, do a show on the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge and the history of it. So join Steve and I tomorrow for episode 215. We can't wait to bring it to you. Alec, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, man. And the same with you, Amber. Thanks for Thank you, coming on. And remember, if you take your rubbish out or bring it in, I should say, take it out. And if it's not in the bin, if it's not in the bin, it will be on you. Here's Alex to take us out with that message. Thanks, mate. Totally agree. It's not in the bin, it's on you. And don't trade out parks and wildlife like a rubbish dump. And, and don't just go whack with your rubbish, put it in the bin. Thanks for joining us today on episode 214 today on the 15th of June. We've had a lot of fun this morning and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Barry Taylor on behalf of myself, Alec and Amber going into Georgia this week. Thank you so much for tuning in and good morning to everyone now. Thanks for watching and tuning in and watching episode 214 today. Thanks for your company today. And do the right thing. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good day. Good morning from everyone. On at the daily rest. Good morning.